For over 30 years, Berwyn's been proudly supporting you. At all the important stages in life. And in business. We know we are living in strange times, but we're in this together. And right now, we want you to know that wherever you are, when you need us, we're here for you. You are joining with audiences from across the globe to enjoy Harrogate International Festival's series of online events. Stream straight from our home to yours. Sit back, relax, and enjoy an interview with Adam Rutherford as part of Berwyn Salon North, hosted by Helen Bagnall. We promise you've got the best seats in the house. So um, welcome back to Berwyn Salon North, Unwind and Evolve. Our next speaker is Dr. Adam Rutherford. I think he's the only speaker we've ever had at Berwyn Salon North that when we opened to questions, someone shouted, yes, will you come back? And it turns out the answer to that was yes, but not quite in the way that we might have all imagined. Um, as we are all here to take a bold step into digital, um, Harrogate International Festivals, as I don't need to tell you, is one of the most talented, ambitious and glorious festivals in the country. And it's my great pleasure to work together with them on Berwyn Salon North, which is a series of salons designed to get to big ideas into our lives. Um, for those of you who come to Berwyn Salon North a lot, I know you will have had a lot to think about during lockdown, about how to keep yourselves happy and hearty um, in whatever you might be facing during lockdown. Uh, and if not that, then I know you'll have had a lot of really good books to read. Um, I'm Helen Bagnall, uh, and I'm going to be talking to Adam Rutherford, um, covering ideas about race and reality from history and science. Um, Adam studied genetics at UCL. Uh, he's a science writer and broadcaster and a brilliant communicator. Um, he's written and presented many award-winning uh, series and programmes for the BBC, including, I'm sure you've seen BBC, uh, heard BBC Radio 4's Inside Science and The Curious Case of Rutherford and Fry. Not only that, but mine got, does he have range as an author? Uh, he wrote the Welcome Book shortlisted Creation, uh, the Book of Humans about human exceptionalism, and the massively titled A Brief History of Everyone Who Has Ever Lived about the genetics of ancestry. And it really was. And now he's here uh, to help people to know how to use genetics um, and all this new science when talking to someone ex who is expressing racist views in uh, how to argue uh, with a racist. Hello, Adam. Hi, Helen. It's so lovely to see you again. It's yeah. When did we last, we spoke in, I guess, February, just before all this, uh, well, uh, just before the world turned upside down, right? It really was, yeah. I think it was sort of mid-February, just at um, the point of your publishing. And Dominic Cummings was in the news then, but uh, <laughs> for different I reasons. I didn't engineer that. <laughs> it was, a, it was a, a unbelievably, um, well, fortunate coincidence in terms of talking about some of the issues that we did talk about in that salon event um, in London because this is the third time I've launched a book with, with you. We've done the first talk. Um, for you. It's always a pleasure to, to talk to you. Oh, and I hope we have many more. It, it kind of leads me really nicely into my first question for you, which is, you know, how did you know uh, when you were writing it, when you were even thinking about it, that a book called How to Argue with a Racist was going to be as unfortunately necessary as it's turned out to be? <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's that's... Well, I suppose you, you sort of anticipate that the culture is changing or that there is a necessity for um, a book on a particular subject. And, and I, I guess I sort of got lucky with with A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived, uh, which was published ooh, like three years ago, four years, four years ago now, um, because it was just at the point where there was a sort of crescendo of people's interest in in things like ancestry testing um kits you know the 23andme's and the ancestry.coms and so that that sort of I, I was lucky that i anticipated that and it hit, hit a uh, um uh the, the the crest of a wave in a sense and and this time around i mean lucky and grateful are not the right words to describe what has happened since it was published in in february i i um i suppose it's simply that the cultural conversation changes at a pace and one always tries to be on the upward slope of anticipating those sorts of those sorts of discussions of course you know the the, the racialization of covid um which is a very real thing and i've updated the the book 
for the US market, which is coming out in August, and it will be it will be updated for the for the paperback publication in um, February next year. And and the Black Lives Matter um, demonstrations and riots and the killing of George Floyd, you know, these these are things that I'm in in I'm grateful that the book has 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 resonated with people during this insane time that we're going through, um, but sort of not celebratory. And there are, you know, there's a whole suite of of books that have become bestsellers alongside this one, as we're all, you know, yearning to understand these issues better and understand our history better and understanding how to how to talk about race uh, in the 21st century so it's you know I'm 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 happy but it's not celebratory I think that's right and it, I, I can really I really it's, it's 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 so right to say kind of yearning for the language to talk about it I think you know one of the things you just couldn't have predicted is that how how much all of us are are um you know need these kind of like ways of talking about it in a rational way that we can talk um and discuss issues and i think it's a you know excellent um book to help us in that way um i uh, one of the you know one of the things you say if you said when um when you were publishing the book is that you really don't want um racists to be able to justify racism with science with genetics but the history of race and the history of genetics have been closely entwined and not always happily uh, historically. And did you want to to use your knowledge to set the record straight? Did you feel that there was work to be done to get the message out of where we are with genetics and race now that you wanted to contribute to? Yeah, absolutely. Because they, they, unequivocally, genetics and evolutionary biology, which are my, my, my areas of scientific expertise, are were founded out of um, the, the, sort of the projects that we fondly refer to as the Enlightenment or the Scientific Revolution, but they're also absolutely intertwined, inextricably intertwined with the whole European expansionism project, um, colonializ- colonialization, and, and, you know, it's an age of empire and an age of plunder. And it is the, the, the purest foundations of biology not just of evolutionary biology or human biology, are very closely tied with um, the, the, the sort of co-opting or the marshalling of this emerging science of the 17th and 18th century. I mean, we now think of it as a pseudoscience, but at the time it is people like Linnaeus and Kant and Voltaire. Um, and they are involved with the marshalling of trying to categorize humans uh, in order effectively either overtly or subconsciously uh, to subjugate these people to justify um, uh, Europeans expansionism and and enslavement of of other people and we see that in the writings of Linnaeus and Kant and Voltaire and and, and these heroes of Western philosophy these these sort of founding fathers of the way that Western culture is is built to this to this day because the first attempts to classify humans, the introduction of taxonomy for the first time, really seriously, um, by people like Linnaeus, using systems that we still use to this day, uh, they include humans. But it's not just higher; it's, it's not just classification. It is hierarchical classification, because you have the descriptions of the people of the world, primarily determined by a phenotypic characteristic, which is skin color pigmentation, um, but very closely associated with a lot of value judgments on behavior and people's cultures. And at the top of that hierarchy is Europeans who are gentle and acute and inventive. Um, whereas the other people of the world are to varying degrees um, and varying descriptions, uh, not as good, not as worthy, not as, not as pure or as attractive, both physically and, and um, in terms of behavior as white Europeans. So this is the establishment of the structural racism in our society that continues to exist. And it is fundamentally based upon pseudoscientific ideas. Now, why it's important to talk about that from my point of view, I know this is a long answer, but you've interviewed me many times and you know my answers are always like this. <laughs> I'm familiar with this. <laughs> yeah. I just finished this thought, and then, and then no, 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 no. It's it's a massive subject, Adam, and we want to get to grips with it. It's not easy. So, so I think I think that the 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 key idea which is worth 
exploring in terms of the history is the recognition that our science, biology, and more generally science, is structurally racist in the same way that, that society is structurally racist. But in, in one sense, the foundation of these, these this, this science via uh, you know, Linnaeus and taxonomy and then anthropology, which is also very closely at, uh, associated with European expansionism, um, and then the emergence of genetics in the 19th century and into the 20th century, this trajectory is really, really worth understanding and also celebrating because it is a genetics is a science that is founded. There's, its most basic foundations are the, the co-opting of a racist ideology, the co-opting into a racist ideology, I should say. But it is also the only academic field, the only way of knowing that has demonstrated the absolute falsity of biological race. And so that that's that's good. That's good. That's a, that's science at its best. That's science working, because it was started as a means of justifying bigotry and justifying political ideologies, and it is ended, or it continues to be in the twenty first century, a mechanism by which we can say that that um, those foundations were pseudo scientific. And so the whole point of the book, I guess, is is to say. You know, racism is real and does exist, but it is not biologically encoded, as has been postulated for several hundred years. Um, and and knowing that, and knowing the language, and knowing the, the some of the detail, because this stuff is really complicated, is should be should should be a sort of utility function, a toolkit in in contesting bigotry and specifically in the form of racism when science is being co-opted to to do that again. Because the arguments we hear today are, are just more complicated recapitulations of stuff that's been going on for several hundred years. And, you know, just by saying it and just by repeating it doesn't make it right. And so I want people to be kitted out, you know, to, to, to have the language and to have the knowledge to say, you know what, these things are not true and this is why. That is a massive, massive answer. Um, and it was a massive question. So uh, ab absolutely fitting. I think we could spend a little bit more time going through that because obviously we have the benefit. Well, you've got 25 years experience <laughs> working in genetics. And I've read your book um, many times. And I want us all to be together with it because it is really complicated. Um, and I think before we have a little bit of a closer look at classification, I just wanted to ask you, because it really did take me a while to get my head around, is you're really keen to explain why it's not helpful to say that race does not exist or that race is a social construct even though both of those things are sort of technically true uh, and I just wanted to make sure that we all understand you know what you know just that we all understand why that is the case yeah absolutely so so well-meaning people anti-racists or non-racists um, as the realization in the late 20th century uh, emerged that the, the, the way we talk about race and the way we talk about the people of the rest of the world using you know, the, the vernacular the stuff that everyone uses when we talk about black people or East Asians or whatever the contemporary language is. But the realization from genetics was that the human variation doesn't align particularly well, or in some cases at all, with those social descriptors. And th there was a, well, I've been guilty of it in the past, but many people who are non-racists or, or anti-racists sort of ha know this, um, this sort of scientific information, and the temptation is to say, well, race doesn't exist. Um, now, that that is both not correct, and I argue in the book that it's also not helpful, because you're asking, you're sort of denying people their experience. If I say a black person, or a black man, or a black woman, then you have a rough idea of what, what I'm talking about. I'm probably talking about someone with um, darkly pigmented skin of recent African descent. From a biological point of view, it's a it's a descriptor which is of almost no utility, and maybe we'll talk about that in more detail um, later. But the key thing is that the biology d d describing people as black does, is is not reinforced by 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 the biology by the under underlying genetics that we now understand, which doesn't mean that race doesn't exist. Race does exist because we have this language, we have this consensus language that we all sort of broadly understand it's wildly inconsistent over historical time but we've, we're locked into a system currently which is three four hundred years old um one of the reasons i talk about the history a lot is because it's we we often don't have long memories past you know a few centuries and it's very tempting to assume that our 
our what, what we say today and what we understand today socially and culturally is has always been the case especially when it's it's sort of experientially true and um, where pigmentation or certain other physical characteristics are so um visually stimulating or, or we, we recognize them so quickly that we say well this must be true there must be a race of people that we can refer to as blacks or east asians or or whatever the, the category we're talking about but you only need to go back a thousand years or into the Roman era to see that this isn't how people were classified. And it's, it, that's not to say that Romans weren't massively prejudiced and extraordinarily violent and, and, um, uh, and uh, had their own tribalisms and, and conflicts as a result. It's just that they weren't done down the same racialized lines that, that we, we have today. So these definitions are cultural, they're social and they're temporary and maybe in the future, we will move away from the current ones that we use and into a perhaps a more useful and perhaps a more kind um, way of recognizing that people are different culturally, um, but uh, unified as one species. Yeah, and I found um, I found um, your description of uh, I found my work I found it really easy to understand that by the way you described the Islamic slave trade. You know, going right back to the beginning, um, where there's a completely different classification. And I think, how did they describe the Europeans? Yeah, so, so this, is, this is one of the earlier, um, or possibly the earliest, description of the people of the world that is primarily determined by pigmentation and, their, and the association between pigmentation and, and behaviour. We see it a lot from the 17th century onwards from European um, pseudoscientists or philosophers or thinkers or, or whatever you want to call them. But there's there's one example that comes earlier than that, which is from Avicenna, so the great Uzbeki um, sort of scientist and, and thinker and philosopher. And the Islamic slave, tra slave trade is something that I was almost completely unaware of um, until researching and writing this book. But it lasted for hundreds of years and it, was, it included the enslavement of millions of people. Um, Avicenna describes in one of his works um, the, the pigmentation of certain peoples of the world and therefore their aptitude, their appropriateness for enslavement. And part that, that he uses language to describe sub-Saharan African people, which is very similar to, to what comes later with Europeans, um, which is that they are strong or uh, but lazy or feckless and those sorts of stereotypes. Um, but he also describes Northern Europeans with pasty skin as being stupid and feckless and therefore um, uh, suitable for enslavement by Middle Easterners, by Islamic slave traders. Now, I'm not saying that that is right or morally right, uh, so factually right or morally right, in the same way that Linnaeus was neither factually right nor, nor morally right. The important bit to recognize here is it's exactly the same model. You, you, you dehumanize people and devalue people by using a sort of pseudo-scientific set of criteria in order to justify subjugation of those people. It's just that it was a different subjugation, it was a different set of people that was being subjugated or enslaved during the Islamic slave era than it was during the European colonialization uh, era. So, you know, these things are inconsistent. They are, they, they, they change through time and that is because they're culturally determined and not biologically encoded. And so when we're looking at, um, I think, as you put it, as these kind of Victorian, very intelligent, um, you know, very successful, eminent um, people in their field, uh, classifying everything according to their own needs for hierarchy. You know, is it we just have to accept that Do we have to accept that part of the Enlightenment, part of that time was very intelligent people getting involved in things they just didn't understand? Well, yes, I think fundamentally that is true. And there are wonderful things about the Enlightenment. And, and, and I, I have some issues with the term itself. I had some issues with all sorts of classification, not just biological. But we put these post hoc labels on events, uh, which, which often have the effect of romanticizing them or simplifying them. There's a, I suppose, you know, it's a little bit like the whole pulling down statues debate currently that we put up statues of people and... I think this is an argument made by David Olashoga who, who, very wisely that the, the, the argument that you're erasing history by pulling down statues is, is 180 degrees the wrong way around. Putting up statues 
is is the erasure of history because there is no context for them there is no understanding of who these people were or the cultural climate in which they existed there's they're 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 not uh, nuanced in the sense that you can say there were good things about this person and there were awful things about this person they're just there they're monoliths and they don't say anything about about history at all uh, other than that someone at some point has decided these people ought to be celebrated in contrast pulling down the statues enlightens us i'm not saying we should pull down all statues and i recognize this is a complex and, and nuanced debate but who had heard of edward colston before that statue was pulled down in bristol I, apart from the local residents of bristol i would argue that that the, the answer is not very many people and and what's happened as a result of this is that there is now a far greater understanding and and desire to understand british colonial history and our involvement in um in the, the pernicious slave trade as a result of that action so it, it is the exposure of these ideas which which i think is is important we we, we need to go past saying the enlightenment was a good thing and the scientific revolution is a good thing um, we need to go past that into trying to understand that both of those two projects, for all their goodness, were effectively the reinforcement of power structures which existed at that time and the suppression of other peoples of the world as part of that. And we still live in that era. And we still know that, that structural racism, which is pervasive in society today also exists in science as a result of the fact that the scientific revolution and the enlightenment were for all their good points which is many were also a reinforcement of the structural and power hegemony that existed at that time yeah got it and actually you know um listening back to the event that we uh, did in you know in february the degree with which we are able to have some of these conversations it just wasn't quite there even six months ago. I think, you know, it, it, we are beginning to have nuanced debates on, on a national um, uh, stage that just wasn't quite quite coming, you know, earlier this year. Um, so one of, the, one of the, the areas you cover in your book is this idea of racial purity. And I want to talk about that as an idea um, for a little bit. You know, um, as I understand it, it was saying really up until the advent of um, genetics, we, it was really pigmentation we were looking at in skin in terms of um, classification. You know, what happened with the advent of um, genetics? What happened when we begin, began to look at um, the genetics of or the genomes of Africans? What did we begin to learn that really um, helped us in our understanding of race? Yeah, so, so I mean, there's a really important point to, to, to make here, uh, which relates to your earlier question about, you know, well, well-intentioned people saying there's no such thing as race. People are different, right? People are different around the world. People are phenotypically different, which means they have different physical characteristics. And there is underlying genetic difference, which is what encodes those, those physical differences. We're also culturally different in different places around the world. And, you know, we're culturally different on the same street in London or you you in North London, me in South London. Um, so it, it I'm not a blank slatist here. I'm not an anti-realist here. I'm, I'm, I think recognizing those differences between people is really important. What we do know and what the genetics says very clearly is those differences, both behaviorally and physically, such as with regards to pigmentation, again, do not align, do not correlate with the, the traditional standards of which we describe um, racial differences b between people. And so this idea of racial purity stems from a sort of a very human, um, a very normal part of the human condition, which is, I, I suppose, it's to do with our desire for narrative and narrative satisfaction in our own lives, in our own history, positioning ourselves in culture, in our families. Um, the problem is that humans are absolutely terrible at doing this. And so we, we, we have very limited sort of cognitive resources to actually understand what our history, our, our genealogical history is actually like. And the reason for that is because it's really messy and it's really hard. So, you know, things like um, Who Do You Think You Are, which is, I think is a great program. It's a, you know, it's an amazing way of telling history. But what we do when we look at those family histories, if anyone's done their own genealogy, is we identify people from our past that we can, right? Because most people pass through history leaving nothing but shadows and dust. But 
we focus on the people that we can identify and we attach narratives to them and we we position ourselves at the end of that or as part of that narrative as a means of, of, of you know identifying ourselves a means of our self-identity the trouble with doing that is we ignore almost all of our ancestors pretty much everyone that you're descended from uh, we, we have no understanding of no no, no knowledge of and, and no documentary history of but but what we do is we identify the people we are descended from and say ah well that is why i am the way i am so in a sort of trivial way uh, i talk about this in a brief history as well as in this in in the race book is you know white europeans they love finding out that they're descended from vikings because the vikings are super awesome right you know that's that's uncontroversial the problem is that the vikings existed at a time by which point all our family trees have coalesced into one big you know spludge um just invented a new word there, <laughs> genetic term i'm going to use it from now on i think i've got it i think i've got it <laughs> yeah <laughs> um which means that every european is descended from vikings regardless of whether you're blonde haired and blue eyed or scandinavian or uh, you know moroccan the vikings were were more than a thousand years ago and it means that all of our family trees have coalesced by that point so yes you are i can look at you and i know you helen and you i can tell you with absolute certainty that you are definitely descended from from vikings and you know we're talking in yorkshire right now effectively we are well, there's, there's a there's a huge you know the the, the Jorvik center in in york and there's that, that correlation between the Vikings on, on that coast. I'm from East Anglia. The Vikings were bothering our coast for all of that all of that time as well. That is true. And it's the same for everyone. It is the same for everyone in the whole of Europe. Everyone is descended from Vikings in the same way that they're also descended from the people that Vikings conquered, the people that Vikings traded with, the people who cleaned the Viking warriors' boots, um, and that we're also descended from angles and saxons and jews and huns and allens and all of the people of europe more than a thousand years ago and and three thousand years ago it's all of the people of the earth so if you want to extract cultural or tribal identity from history go for it fill your boots what you can't do is say that it's genetically encoded or that it's some kind of biological essentialism because that is simply not the case that is not what the science says it's not what the genealogy says so you know identity is tr really important tribal identity is really important to people and i am not in any way denying that what i am saying is you can't justify it using genetics because that is not what the genetics says because the genetics says that we're continually making friends with each other as we move around the world right <laughs> Are we in euphemism territory? <laughs> I don't know. It's a strange new world, the digital world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite, quite right. We we are um, very good at well, I, the, the the two things that human re humans really excel at is moving, so migration, and making friends, as you put it. <laughs> um, what 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 it, what it means is that we are descended from multitudes. We're descended from everyone, and there is no such thing as as racial purity there is no such thing as as, as a sort of a pure blood or a, a lineage not even the royals can claim that um just because we know the royal family back to uh, you know charlemagne or even even earlier and we have that documented because they are royals you are equally descended from charlemagne as as queen elizabeth or Prince Charles, and, and everyone in Europe is literally the same. You know, we did we did that thing um, before when uh, I've probably done it a couple of times with with you at, at salon events, where the Danny Dyer story, where he he on um, on who do you think you are? They found out that he was descended from Edward the Third, which is cool because not everyone can do that using paper trails, um, where they actually have documentary history that he was. I think it was twenty two generations directly from. Edward III. And he that says, pretty cool. I'm going to buy myself a rough. <laughs> That's exactly right. He said, I'm going to treat myself to a massive rough. <laughs> Fill your boots, Danny. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the the truth of the matter is, and, and I worked this out with, with a couple of colleagues at UCL, the mathematical possibility, probability, that anyone with long-standing British ancestry who was born in the 1970s, as Danny Dyer was, 
the, the probability that they are not descended from Edward III is it's zero. It, it's it's like ten to the minus twenty three by one conservative estimate that I that I put in the, in the book. It, this is just how family trees work. We we, we are, our family trees branch out from us when you're the individual and two parents and four grandparents and eight grandparents. But after a while, they just begin to collapse in on each other. And so you have, um, you know, two to the power of N, where N is the generational number. You have two to the power of N um, positions on your family tree. Sorry to get mathsy with you, people of Harrogate. Um, but they may be filled by, those positions might be filled by the same people many times over. And, and it, we're just very inbred. And I can say that with impunity because I'm from Suffolk. You say inbred. I'm hearing, great, when the rough shops open, I'm going straight out there <laughs> to buy myself a rough, <laughs> whatever that is. <laughs> I, felt, I felt super nerdy by p- pointing out, I, I, sp- I spent a lot of time talking to historians and getting them to, because I'm not a historian, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a biologist, a scientist, um, making sure that I'm not screwing up the history here. Um, in, in my work and one of them pointed out in one of the most brilliantly nerdy sentences I think she had ever said was um, you know that technically roughs didn't really come into fashion until about the 16th century and of course Edward III was a 14th 15th century ruler but sorry yeah 14th century ruler so Danny Dyer treating himself to a massive rough because he found out that he was descended from Edward III is actually anachronistic sorry I <laughs> Well, fake news in action there and brilliant chance to put it right live. Um, well, I'm glad you've saved everyone um, the uh, I saved everyone from the bother of having to do an ancestry test uh, this Christmas. Nice save there, Adam. Um, but, do you, you know, just because uh, racial uh, purity can't be proved doesn't mean that it isn't being bandied about. You know, white supremacists really, really enjoy um, using this as a term and are pretty committed to it. OK, I guess my question is then why do they feel so emboldened by the science, by the genetics? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that in one sense, I try not to focus on white supremacy. Of course, yeah. There are people who are so, they're so absurd and they're so not, their, their, their views, their hateful views are not founded on rational, reasonable principles. Um, the, the Jonathan Swift quote, which I will now mangle, which is that, well, the modernized version being, you, you can't reason someone out of a position that they didn't reason themselves into, which I think is true. Um, the the co-opting again of of science that it's it's the you know it must be true because science says it or I've misunderstood this science but or using misunderstood science in order to justify that position uh, is something that white supremacists do because they're obsessed with white purity and believe wrongly that genetics can can indicate that that purity. Um, uh, so so in a sense I'm I. I think it's they're sort of like low hanging fruit in terms of arguing or, or using science or trying to correct people's mis- misappropriated or mis- misunderstood science. I think you see the same on the same spectrum. You see normal non racist people also adopting this kind of biological essentialism um, and, and often via these ancestry testing kits that say, oh, well, look, I'm, you know, it turns out I've, I'm, 40 percent swedish or um that's why i like fish right right or i'm 25 percent uh hispanic or spanish and that's why i have a fiery temperament um uh, of course you know there there isn't a way of being 40 percent swedish or or 25 percent spanish that that is a sort of impossibility because these are um that these are cultural definitions that are bound bound to statehood um, that there's a sort of inference of truth that under, underwrites them, which is that I have shared genetic information. I've got DNA, which is similar to a proportion of people who exist in Spain or in Sweden or wherever in the world today. Um, and from that, we go, oh, my God, I'm, I'm 40 percent Swedish or, or, you know, whatever the numbers come back and say that they are. But also the temptation is therefore to go and this informs my character. This informs my behavior. I am. Um, I have this fiery temperament uh, because I am descended from from Spanish people, 
you know, a, a, a clumsy national stereotype, which I, I don't really know whether it's true, true or not. Um, they're, they're often positive attributes. We, we never, we never say, oh yeah, I'm 20% descended from this people. And that explains why I'm so absolutely rubbish at ping pong. Or, <laughs> and like, boring. So, yeah. Well, I'm boring and short tempered. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we, we don't do that, right? Because we want positive attributes that we can attribute to specific causes. But biology just doesn't do work like that. We don't inherit those those behaviours in a genetic way. We inherit them in a cultural way, mostly from our immediate family, kin, and 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 um, and peers. And the impact of that, gen- it, it, you know, sort of drops off a cliff after a few generations. We don't really have any genetic in, in, in information. Uh, or genetic influence from people beyond a few generations above us anyway and that is not to say that there aren't national stereotypes which which may be may have some truth in them um people who live together have similar characteristics are they biologically encoded i do not think that they are and so the genetic test is, goes back to the earlier point i was making people's identity people's tribalism people's behavior is important i'm not denying them that i'm just saying that you, you genetics says very little on the whole about those sorts of behaviours. And so the, using science, using genetics as a crutch to support those things, I think is is wrong and and and, and not useful. And and you know that that's that's what a lot of the sort of themes of the book are about. Mm, you think it's genetics job to get this information out properly? Geneticists? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I I, I really do. And I think that we face a weird sort of conundrum within science, which is that in general, we are um, not predisposed to the, the politics that is associated uh, further down the line with, with, with our research. You know, a lot, of, a lot of scientists just want to get on with it. You know, here's the data, here's my results, push it out there and let, let other people deal with the political fallout from that. There's a, there's a sort of ongoing argument and an ongoing belief amongst many skeptics and many scientists that, that, that science is morally neutral, that it is amoral, and that data is 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 data and, and it's pure. It's only when it enters the public domain and becomes part of public discourse or policies that it that it can be politicized in in, in whatever direction the the holder of that of, of that data is. I, th- I think that is untrue. I think it has always been untrue. I think science has always been political. Um, it, it's only true in in a very pure so that that's the that's the principle the whole principle of the scientific method is to extract our human baggage our psychology and our uh, and our, our various perversions out of the the way that we understand science the trouble is it's never occurred it's never happened once and, and in my field in, in 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 genetics we know this very well because we use data sets which are primarily d- d- for the result of of looking at european people um, and we extrapolate them to to to, to explain the, the the rest of the world, and we don't even know whether that's right or wrong. I suspect it's it's not useful in many examples because we haven't even looked in places like Africa. So we are beginning to we're beginning to recognise these faults, but our our genomic surveys of Africa until very recently have been almost non-existent compared to um, the extreme depth with which we understand the genetics of Europeans. Very similar effect in a related way is that you know the real world repercussions of this are not just understanding um, our evolutionary trajectory in history, but like drug design is historically and to a certain extent today almost entirely uh, based on understanding the biology of not just Europeans but European men, right? And there are sort of historical reasons for that which is sort of convenience rather, rather than any sort of inherent bias. Um, but they're also the, the structural biases that exist within our, our, our societies that it takes effort to, to rec- recognize that, uh, you know what, we, we didn't test this on women. Um, I mean, the, the roots of this are, are that mice, female mice are more expensive to keep because they have menstrual cycles. So at some point in the 20th century, we kind of stop doing it. Um, as a result of that, embedded in our culture is well. There's we we don't actually know whether loads of drugs work on women. Hey, half the population of the world. I did not know that. I didn't know that about the mice. Um, 
Wow. Um, we, we need to bring it to a close, but I do want to touch on sport because you love it. And because I think it's a really easy way of people understanding some of the bigger themes that we've spoken about and, and the way that we inherit them. So I guess, you know, I guess, I guess a question to close then that might encompass some of that is why is it important to, under, to, to understand a bit deeper about the relationship between race and sport, sport reporting? Yeah, well, like you said, I mean, I, I, I do love my sport. and um, What's your favourite sport? I don't know that. Well, not just my favourite sport, but cricket. Cricket, is, yes. Cricket, <laughs> Winning I, fans in North Yorkshire there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, my dad, my dad is from Yorkshire I as well. I know that, yes. <laughs> um, but, but then when I said, I think I, when I said this once in either Ripon or, or um, and my brothers were born in Ripon too. So, but, but dad was born in Robin Hood's Bay. And I think I said this at the Ilkley um, Book Festival. And they just snorted. They were just like, you know, that's not Yorkshire. Or <laughs> that's, that's a different part of Yorkshire. It's like, okay, fine. I'm not getting into it. But Harrogate, it, of course, is your favourite place in Yorkshire. Moving on. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I, cricket isn't just my favourite sport. I think cricket is close to being the high point of human civilization. Oh. Um, and in fact, we record this on the day after that Michael Holding, I don't know whether you saw it, but um, the, 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 t- the test series against the West Indies has just started praise the heavens um and michael holding did, did had this amazing speech um when he was asked as a common as a commentator michael holding being one of the great west indian uh, bowlers uh, of the 70s and 80s and um he, he talked so eloquently about the othering of 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 um of black people in in sport in in, in our, our sport in in cricket and how structural racism is absolutely present in our sport and in, in our society. And in some ways, I feel sad that some of the most eloquent people talking about this now are not our politicians, uh, but but our sports people. Um, John Barnes is 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 amazingly eloquent on on racism within within sport, particularly within football. Um, un, un, well, sort of related, but not on the same topic. We've got Marcus Rashford leading political campaigns over and above um, both the government and the opposition, which is sort of wonderful and also tragic at the same time. Anyway, that wasn't what you asked me. Um, I think sport is important, even if you don't like it, because it is historically one of the ways that we see the behaviours of, of people of the rest of the world, often at their extreme talents, you know, the, the humans doing the best that humans can do and so it's very tempting therefore to use those examples to reinforce or to or to make stereotypes about the people from whom the countries and the people from whom they are are descended and again reiterating the point people are different around the world people have biologically different uh, abilities and, and traits and sport is not the level playing field that we might think it is biology plays a huge inherent role in sporting success in very trivial ways that are so obvious you know tall people are better at basketball short small people are better at being jockeys um those are heavily heritable genetically in, in informed characteristics the trouble is that when you look at things like the fact there hasn't been a white man in the final 100 meters in the olympics since 1980 alan wells in Moscow, um, and that, that was the last time that anyone ran over 10 seconds in the final, you think, well, actually, that, does, does that not say something? Does that not mean that um, African-Americans or Caribbeans or Canadians, people descended from the enslaved of West Africa during transatlantic slavery, does that not mean this result in, in the Olympics? Does it not mean that they are biologically better at, at short distance running or explosive energy sports? Uh, that seems like a reasonable um, deduction from that data set, but it's just not true. And it's not true partly because the sample size is minuscule, 58 men, partly because we, we don't see it from a genetic point of view at all. There is a genetic basis to being better at, at um, short uh, explosive energy sports. It's not very well understood. Much It's understood a lot less well than than often is reported, often talked about. So I think the point here is that if you're using those sorts of examples within sport 
to reinforce cultural and racialized stereotypes. Even if they sound like positive attributes, because everyone wants to be faster or, or you know, more muscly or you know, smarter, whatever, what you're actually doing is two things. One, they're not biologically true, right? They're, 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 they're just not correct. And the, the, the detailed analysis of it is in the book and we, won't, we shouldn't go into it now. But the second thing you're doing is actually reinforcing the stereotypes which are embedded in our culture, which are descended from the beginning of this conversation, the, the creation of race in the 17th and 18th century. That, for example, black people are, have greater physical strength and physical prowess, um, uh, whereas Europeans are inventive and intelligent. Um, and we see this in our language. We see this in our sports commentary in one particular study that I talk about at length in the book, which shows that commentary on elite sports in a period in the, in the 21st century, up until I think it was 2011 from memory, um, in the majority of cases where a black athlete was being talked about or being described, the commentators talked about their physicality and their strength and their speed uh, and their, their ancestry being the key factor here. And in the majority of cases where a white athlete was being discussed, they talk about their inventiveness, their intelligence, um, and, and not their physicality, their hard working and hard training. Now, that is a racial disparity which is both biologically untrue, is rooted in, in the, 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 the early scientific racism of the 17th and 18th century, but it is so baked into our culture that we don't even notice. And I think you will notice now, because to, if, if anyone's watching this, next time you're watching a sporting event and listening to the commentary, your ears prick up once you know these sorts of data and go, there it was. There was the reference to this athlete's physicality rather than their hard work. Um, I, I refer to this as being a, a, a reliance on auspicious ancestry rather than rather than one's hard work or one, one's um, training. And I think that's unfortunate. I think it's unfortunately doubly so because a lot of athletes believe this too. Um, so that's, that's one of the key ideas I want to disabuse people of. You do it so brilliantly. And as a swimmer, um, I, you know, really, really enjoyed uh, uh, the kind of deconstruction of swimming too. Um, I, uh, we have to bring this to an end now, Adam. We, uh, we've, it's gone so fast. We're completely um, out of time. I'm so glad we managed to get sport in though, because it is so relatable. And I think really easy to understand a lot of the things we've talked about in uh, our day to day, which is really important and a really big um, part of your book, which is available in our foyer, in our virtual foyer. So <laughs> no need not to find out more about Adam's ideas. Um, so it just remains for me to say thank you so much, Adam, for being here, um, for uh, Bo and Sam and all. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's lovely to talk to you. Helen, you know it's always a pleasure. You've, no you've been nothing other than a, one of my strongest champions now for three books. And I've got another three in the pipeline <laughs> keep them coming adam um thank you so much for being here for berwin's salon north isn't he incredible all that and dad from yorkshire too and also harrogate his favorite town so <laughs> <laughs> perfect speaker for berwin's salon north um thank you so much and this salon is now closed Thank you so much for um, being part of Berwyn's Salon North, Unwind and Evolve. I hope that you found new confidence in talking about race and science, having heard from Adam, have understood a bit deeper the relationship between the planet beneath our feet and the way we live, from Lewis, and fully understand that the world is in favour of the larks, like me, from Claudia, but that it is possible to have a much better relationship with rest. It's been superb to be able to do this Berwyn Salon North together. Many thanks to Berwins. And from me and all at Harrogate International Festivals, thank you for being part of it. This salon is now closed. Thanks for joining us. If you have enjoyed this event as part of the Harrogate International Festivals, please do think about a donation to ensure that our festivals can survive in the future. Donations can be made by texting HIF and the amount to 70085. For more events, please visit our online hub, The Hiff Player. It's packed with upcoming live streams, events you've missed, archive recordings, and much more. 
For over 30 years, Berwyn's has been proudly supporting you. At all the important stages in life. And in business. We know we're living in strange times, but we're in this together. And right now, we want you to know that wherever you are, when you need us, we're here for you.